meeting is now Thank being recorded. Thank you for our uh, webinar of today. So we're going to discuss um, uh, GDPR today, which is the uh, General Data Protection Regulation, which has come into effect as of 25th of May uh, of this year. Um, of course, GDPR will affect uh, all European organizations, but it might also affect some non-European organizations, for instance, American organizations. So um, um, we're going to be talking about that later, of course. So the content of today, first we're going to start with um, what GDPR actually is all about. I'm going to explain some, some fundamentals, some basics on GDPR. Then we're going to look at um, some drivers for GDPR, why the European Commission has actually decided to, uh, to enforce this law at present day. We're going to look at some main principles or aspects of GDPR, territorial scope, practical considerations, and we're going to look at some risks that might be involved when it comes to processing personal data. All right, let's start with um, what GDPR actually is all about. Well, in scope of uh, GDPR are uh, a few uh, fundamental uh, principles. The first one is that the privacy rights of individuals actually is going to be improved, meaning that EU citizens will actually have more rights they can uh, um, execute under GDPR. We'll talk about that later. Secondly, um, all organizations within the EU are uh, being held accountable for safeguarding the privacy of individuals. Um, and third, um, organizations have to be absolutely transparent about the way they process data. So um, when it comes to GDPR, there are two main concepts. The first one is privacy, and the second one is uh, personal data, which will I explain further uh, in this presentation. Now, GDPR is all about um, data protection or protection of personal data, meaning that all organizations processing personal data actually have to um, enforce a sufficient technological and organizational measures in order to protect that personal data. Secondly, GDPR is, uh, is the law. R in GDPR stands for regulation. Um, it's not an option. It's not a directive. It actually is the law. It's non-negotiable, and all organizations must comply. Thirdly, um, GDPR applies for all uh, organizations within the 28 member states of the European Union, but it might also affect organizations that are actually based outside the European Union. For instance, uh, American organizations targeting EU citizens. Um, GDPR is, is uh, not something uh, only your IT department should take care of or only your uh, legal department. But GDPR should also be addressed um, on a boardroom level and eventually, you know, GDPR will have to be embedded in your day-to-day -day, uh, operations. So it covers all departments, all aspects of your organization, actually. Okay, there's been a lot of talk about uh, penalties and fines under GDPR. Uh, uh, some people actually think that if you're not compliant or if you're violating uh, GDPR rules, you might face a penalty up to 20 million euros or 4% of your uh, total annual uh, turnover. Uh, that's not completely correct. Of course, the European Union can give a penalty to organizations, but as we will see further on in this presentation, there's actually other instruments to enforce um, the GDPR law. So a penalty or a financial penalty is just one of the instruments the European Union or privacy authorities actually have in order to enforce um, GDPR. Okay. What we're going to do now is look at some drivers for, for privacy. Um, when we look at the developments in uh, modern-day information technology, we are actually seeing that, you know, the whole world is, is going more and more online. Um, where we used to uh, visit the Internet from our traditional desktops or, or laptop computers, 
now actually have internet in our pocket with um, tablets and smartphones everywhere. So internet is virtually everywhere. People are also using more and more social networks like uh, Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter. So um, actually we are sharing more and more of our professional and personal lives uh, online. Another development is that we are moving our data uh, more and more into the cloud, meaning that our data is actually stored well, somewhere in the cloud, somewhere on the internet. And of course, last but not least, um, uh, where in the traditional IT world, um, uh, data processing was actually used for, let's say, recording purposes. Now with the collection of so much data, um, we actually start analyzing data, uh, and, and we are applying artificial intelligence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, this means that um, we are spending more and more time online, and we are actually creating more and more data as we use modern technologies. For example, if we look at uh, what's happening on the internet within uh, a period of, of one minute, um, here are some numbers. Within 60 seconds, you know, every day more than 481,000 uh, tweets are posted, more than 100 million emails are being sent, uh, on an average more than $800,000 is being spent online, etc. Et so with more than 1,400 minutes in one day, you can figure out how much actually is going on uh, on the Internet in present day. Uh, another development which really triggered the European Union to come up with this new uh, privacy law is uh, what they call the business model around the Internet. If we look at organizations like um, Google, for example, well, Google uh, spends billions of dollars every year uh, investing on new data centers. Uh, on the other hand, they report huge profits over, I think, $10 billion dollars. And if you look at the services Google actually provides, like uh, Google Mail or Google Search or YouTube or whatsoever, they're all free, which is quite amazing, of course, because on one hand, they invest a lot of money and are still able to report uh, huge profits, while on the other hand, all the services they provided are free. Well, I think um, the business model around the Internet is, is based on the fact that you no longer actually pay in dollars or euros for contact, but you actually pay with your data. And that data, of course, is, is worth very much for the um, marketing and advertising industry. So instead of paying for content in, in, let's say, real money, you are now paying with data, your personal data, that is. So those are some of the drivers that actually made the European Commission decide that, you know, with all the technological developments of present day, it was time to do something about, you know, protecting uh, the rights and freedoms of uh, individuals when it comes to processing data. All right. So, the main aspects of GDPR. Um, as mentioned, one, one aspect, of course, is privacy. Now, privacy is embedded throughout, you know, the uh, constitution of many European countries also embedded into the uh, UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I think also the U.S. Constitution, uh, specifically the Bill of Rights, does address privacy and, you know, to put it all together in one sentence, privacy actually is, you know, the right to be left alone. Uh, under GDPR, um, uh, privacy um, only applies for what they call uh, informational privacy. Another aspect of GDPR, of course, is personal data, or as said in, in the U.S., personally identifiable information. But the definition of personal data under GDPR is, is um, any data with which you can identify a natural person direct or indirectly. For example, to identify somebody, uh, you need somebody's name or email address, date of birth, or maybe indirect through uh, your license plate or other data, and even uh, your IP address is considered personal data under GDPR. Article 9 of GDPR also addresses what, um, what is called 
special categories of personal data, which is data referring to somebody's race or ethnicity, um, uh, criminal records, data about somebody's uh, religious beliefs, medical records, biometrical uh, data like uh, DNA or other stuff, or membership of a union or a political party. Now, um, when it comes to processing these special categories of, uh, of personal data, I always compare it to uh, <laughs> nuclear waste, actually, because nuclear waste and these special categories of personal data have one thing in common, actually. As soon as it starts leaking, you're in deep trouble. So uh, you have to be very uh, careful, actually, when processing special categories of personal data. And actually, the European Union or the GDPR is very strict about processing these special categories of personal data. Namely, they say, well, it is forbidden, actually, meaning that organizations shouldn't process these types of data at all. So there is one other category that is not specifically mentioned uh, in GDPR, but that's what it's called, sensitive um, personal data, um, for instance, uh, financial records or uh, uh, information about somebody's income, your login credentials, uh, information about somebody's uh, performance at work, your location, or maybe if you have medical problems or uh, a gambling addiction or whatsoever, that what is actually considered sensitive personal data under GDPR. Organizations are allowed to process these types of data, but on the other hand, you have to be very careful when processing sensitive personal data because it actually has quite an impact on the privacy of individuals. And the whole principle of, of processing personal data under GDPR is displayed in, in this slide, meaning that you know, all processing activities and and by processing, we mean um, collecting, storing, and actually using uh, that personal data. Um, it has to be linked to a specific purpose, which is called purpose limitation under GDPR. Meaning, if you process personal data for a specific purpose, you are actually not allowed to process that data for other purposes. And um, all purposes have to be linked to um, what GDPR calls legal grounds, uh, which consists of six legal grounds under which an organization actually is allowed to process personal data. Meaning that, you know, um, prior to GDPR, organizations used to process, meaning collect and storing personal data, maybe on a nice-to-know basis, under GDPR, organizations are obliged to process personal data on a need-to-know basis, meaning the less you collect, the less you store, the less you use or process, the better. Okay, we, when we look at the um, legal grounds or the, the list of sticks I actually refer to, um, these are the ones. There are no more, no less. This is actually the first one, of course, is consent. But there are actually some other legal grounds under which uh, of personal data is lawful under GDPR. For instance, performance of a contract. If I would do a purchase online, um, the organization needs to collect my address, my name, uh, etc., in order to be able to ship uh, my purchase to my home address. So that's what is called uh, performance of a contract under GDPR. In, in some occasions, organizations actually have a legal obligation to collect personal data. For instance, uh, my company has to uh, process my bank account number in order to pay my salary every month. And then there's final interests of subjects. When, when your life actually is at stake, uh, it is allowed for a medical institution actually to process your medical records um, without having to ask for consent to actually process that data. Of course, uh, governments have a public interest, so they need to process personal data of their citizens, for instance, uh, tax authorities. And the last one is called legitimate interest, 
meaning that organizations can actually claim that they have a legitimate interest to actually process personal data of individuals. Um, but there is one very strict condition for that, that the, the, the legitimate interest should actually never override the rights and freedoms of individuals. So uh, direct marketing, of, for instance, is uh, uh, one of those legitimate interests, but also prevention of fraud is considered a legitimate interest under GDPR. Okay, I see some questions popping up, which is great. Thank you for that. We'll get to that later. Um, when we look at, you know, um, the heart of GDPR, there are two main principles that actually are very important. The first one is transparency, which is actually described in uh, Article 12, meaning that all organizations, or controllers as they call it, have to take uh, appropriate measures to provide clear information in a very concise, transparent, and uh, intelligible and easy accessible form to all data subjects. So you have to be absolutely transparent to the data subjects, uh, which data you are actually processing, for what purpose, on what legal grounds, how you are going to protect that data, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, organizations are being held accountable for data protection, and they also have to be able to demonstrate this. Um, so under GDPR, it's not a matter of uh, comply or explain, but actually it is a matter of comply and explain. Okay, now we're going to look at the um, territorial scope of uh, GDPR, which might be interesting for U.S. organizations uh, as well. Um, well, firstly, of course, GDPR applies to all organizations that are established within one of the 28 EU member states, whether it be a headquarter or maybe a branch office, subsidiary or a commercial agent. But it also applies to organizations that are actually performing part of their data processing activities within an EU country. For instance, a US organization that has a data center, let's say in the Netherlands or in Ireland or in Germany, um, uh, that, that would mean that GDPR actually would apply for them as well. On the other hand, um, GDPR may apply to organizations that are actually not established. For example, when we look at uh, American or U.S. organizations, um, any organization uh, anywhere in the world that is actually offering goods or services to citizens inside the EU, um, are within scope of GDPR. And also organizations that are actually monitoring the online behavior of EU citizens fall under the scope of GDPR as well. So, for example, um, your, your, your website is actually targeting EU citizens. For example, your website also has uh, an EU suffix, let's say .nl for the Netherlands, or .de for Germany, or .it for Italy or your website is also being displayed in a local European language, let's say in Dutch or in French or in German, or your website actually accepts payments in, let's say, euros, and then the GDPR says, okay, you are now actually specifically targeting uh, EU citizens, which means you, um, uh, you actually fall under the territorial scope. On the other hand, if you have a website here in the U.S., um, um, that is, well, specifically written for, let's say, U.S. consumers or uh, American business-to-business -business customers, and you are not targeting EU citizens at all, then um, a GDPR does not directly apply to you, even though your website is accessible for EU citizens. So I think that's something um, you really should consider in terms of actually uh, okay some practical considerations um, of course there are a lot I selected uh, five the first one is uh, transparency of course then consent uh, specifically the, um, the rules that apply for actually uh, collecting consent 
going to be talking about cross-border transfers of personal data, data subject rights, which have actually improved under GDPR, and we're going to talk about personal privacy notification obligations for organizations. So, first of all, transparency. Well, the best way actually to display uh, uh, or to state transparency with regard to the processing of uh, personal data is through actually publishing a privacy statement on your website. Now, when you do so and your website is actually targeting EU citizens, you have to take into account that you always mention um, the categories of personal data that you are actually processing, um, for which purpose, of course, and under which legal grounds you are processing that data. You also have to mention uh, which type of security measures you are taking. You have to clarify which rights data subjects actually have. You're going to have to mention if you are actually sharing your data with you know, third parties or, or data processors. When transferring data outside the European economic area, you have to mention that. And of course, you have to mention your data retention period, meaning how long are you actually going to store that data because under GDPR it is not allowed for organizations to actually store data indefinitely. You have to remove it after you know uh, processing or um, uh, if there are other legal uh, retention periods you have to pay for them of course. So transparency is mostly displayed throughout a privacy statement. The second one is consent, which is one of the um, legal grounds on a GDPR. So my advice would be, you know, before you do anything with personal data, make sure that consent is given unless uh, another um, uh, legal ground may apply. Uh, but GDPR is actually setting some strict conditions when it comes to collecting consent of data subjects or individuals. First of all, consent must be given freely. Uh, you may not force data subjects actually to give their consent. Um, the data subject has to be able to make an informed choice, meaning that um, it has to be very clear what you are actually giving your consent for. Um, uh, it will has to consist of will of the data subject, uh, stating that he is okay with the fact that you are processing his or her personal data and preferably throughout a written declaration, meaning, you know, you can tick the box, for instance, if somebody wants to subscribe uh, uh, for receiving a newsletter, it would be wise to have a, a, a little agreement box on top of your or below your website in which uh, somebody can tick it and then it is consent. Um, uh, another important thing is that consent can be withdrawn at any time, meaning that as soon as a data subject withdraws his or her consent, you actually have to stop um, processing his or her personal data. So it is um, impossible actually to say, okay, by giving your consent, we will process your personal data for the next 12 or 24 months. No, it can be withdrawn at any time, actually. Okay, when it comes to um, cross-border transfers of personal data, um, GDPR also sets some strict um, requirements. Actually, when you want to transfer personal data outside uh, the European economic uh, area, um, that can be done under what is called an adequacy decision, meaning that the European Commission has uh, approved to actually transfer personal data to some countries outside the EU. For example, Andorra, Argentina, commercial organizations in Canada, New Zealand, Uruguay, Switzerland. For um, U.S. commercial organizations, um, transfer of personal data uh, is only applicable when these organizations actually are certified through the EU-U.S. Privacy Shield. If not, then um, you will have to use European Commission approved standard contractual clauses or SCCs, which can be found uh, on the internet quite easily. Um, when um, data is being uh, transferred within an organization that has multiple 
subsidiaries throughout the world, you might want to consider uh, drawing up binding corporate rules, which state how the company throughout the world is actually protecting personal data and using that. Or you might want to use you know, institute-approved codes of conduct or certifications. Okay. Um, under GDPR, the, the data subjects or individuals have, have more than extended rights. I'm going to mention um, two of them, actually. The first one is the right to access, meaning that data subjects have the right to know what's being done with their data, and they actually have a right to access that data. Now, if an individual does an access request, an organization um, um, has to process that request within four weeks have to answer or you have to conclude that request within a period of four weeks, which can sometimes be quite challenging, <laughs> I can tell you. <coughs> the other one is uh, what is called the right to be forgotten, meaning that data subjects or individuals can actually request an organization to entirely delete their personal data. Or an individual can request an organization to stop sharing their personal data with third parties, or actually force third parties from using their um, data. Okay, personal data breaches. Under GDPR, uh, organizations are obliged to self-report um, data breaches within uh, a period of 72 hours. If uh, a data breach is actually being discovered, they, you, then an organization must report to the local privacy authority. And if that data breach actually does have a huge impact on the privacy of you know, the individuals uh, to whom that data uh, applies or uh, uh, is about, then you have to actually report that breach to the data subjects as well. I think the difference with the U.S. is um, the notification period on the GDPR, you have to actually report or self-report a data breach to the local privacy authority within 72 hours. Risks. Okay, not all industries, of course, uh, have a high risk profile on the GDPR. Um, some of them do, of course. I think uh, mainly it applies for uh, organizations that actually uh, process a lot of uh, sensitive personal data, for example, you know, educational institutions or financial institutions, maybe payroll service providers, governments, of course, housing, healthcare, um, et cetera. Uh, risks of non-compliance uh, can actually be split up on one hand, there's, of course, a supervisory authority, uh, and they have several instruments. Um, when violating GDPR, it's not always the case that you will be given a, a financial penalty or a fine. Uh, privacy authorities can actually decide to, to investigate um, your processing activity. They you know, can give you a warning. They can actually uh, suspend uh, the processing of personal data. Yeah, in, in some cases, they will actually uh, give you a penalty. On the other hand, um, what you really should um, uh, consider is your stakeholders, of course, meaning your customers, your employees, maybe your ex-employees. Um, everybody has a right to actually complain or file a complaint on the GDPR, which can be done at the uh, local privacy authority. But I think, you know, when, when a huge data breach uh, may occur um, and hit your organization, well, it can be devastating for, uh, of course, your reputation, which might eventually lead to, let's say, the loss of customers or even loss of revenues. So um, when it comes to data protection or protection of uh, personal data, it's not, the risk is not solely at, you know, um, measures taken by privacy supervisory authority, I also think that you should seriously take into account what your stakeholders actually think of, you know, the way you are processing or actually protecting personal data. 
And when we look at the um, um, maturity of GDPR, many, many organizations within the EU uh, actually struggled the last year becoming compliant, and their main focus also was becoming compliant. But when you look at GDPR from you know, a broader perspective, let's say also ERM, um, uh, I think eventually when uh, organizations become more and more mature in terms of uh, their compliance, that might lead to actually a big advantage or uh, even a unique selling point, meaning that privacy protection will actually become business requirement more and more, and it might be the case that eventually you do not have uh, enough measures in place, and you cannot actually safeguard the privacy uh, of individuals, you might be out of business. So it's also something that needs to be discussed on a strategic level. Of course, on an operational level, eventually privacy will have to be embedded into everyday operations. I think now um, many organizations have Becoming compliant by writing, you know, extensive documents and policies, etc. But actually, you know, translating those policies and, and documents into day-to-day -day operations might be quite challenging. Actually, reporting, of course, you have to be transparent. So maybe we will see some, some privacy uh, certificates eventually. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to financial reporting. Uh, yeah, the risk of non-compliance could eventually lead to uh, a penalty, which could mean uh, that you have to uh, that that might require provision on your balance sheet because of an expected liability, and of course, compliance. Every organization in the EU must comply. Okay. Well, um, thank you for your attention uh, so far. I think we will now uh, go towards. Q&A section, so if there are any uh, questions, uh, feel free to ask them and we can uh, discuss them from now. Okay, we have one uh, <laughs> question from uh, Christy, thank you for that. The question was, will we get a copy of the presentation slide deck? Yeah, of course, we will. We will take care of that and send it to you, I think, within 10 days. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, the next question is from uh, Tonya. Thank you, Tonya. The question is, what kind of enforcement action have taken place thus far? Well, actually, um, uh, quite some enforcement actions have taken place. Um, the French Privacy Authority uh, recently fined a company for, I think, about 250,000 euros for, um, for a data breach, actually. Um, the English Privacy Authority, also known as the ICO, or Information Commissioner's Officer, Office has actually fined quite a lot of organizations, and also the Dutch Privacy Authority has given its first fines, and they have started uh, uh, an investigation among 30 randomly selected large organizations in order to investigate whether they are uh, compliant or not. So yes, oversight and enforcement are actually here, and they are here to stay. Yeah, absolutely. More questions? Naomi, thank you. Okay, the question is, we offer legal services to clients in the EU. What do we need to do to be compliant? Well, um, as mentioned earlier, um, any organization, uh, let's say in, in the US, that actually provides uh, goods or services to EU uh, citizens falls within scope of GDPR, meaning uh, what you need to do to be compliant is you have to be transparent, of course, about uh, uh, the processing activities 
with regard to the personal data of your EU clients, meaning you have to state to them clearly um, what data you are collecting, for what purpose, on what legal grounds, how you protect it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, another question is how are the special categories versus sensitive personal data treated differently? Well, actually, uh, let's say commercial organizations are actually not allowed to even process special categories of personal data. I think only governmental institutions are allowed to do so, whereas sensitive personal data can be um, processed by commercial organizations, but they have to be treated with the uttermost care because when sensitive data starts leaking, or is actually being processed in an unlawful way, yeah, then you might be in trouble. So, um, yes, they are uh, treated differently, but uh, when processing sensitive personal data, you have to be very, very careful and very transparent as well. I think that's about it then. Well, thank you so much. So like you stated before, we will have these up on our website within 10 business days. Um, thank you all for joining us, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.